Hello, hello, hello. We're going to live. We are live five seconds. Um, and today is what? Tuesday and exactly two o'clock uh, p.m. in Eastern Time. And we have uh, podcast number 13. Mm -hmm. it's, we should be careful with the number 13. <laughs> and it is about heteroglossia and uh, heterodiscursia. Uh, people ask about this topic, and I think we touched, and it just reminded me that we touched this topic several times in previous mm -hmm. podcasts. So it's interesting uh, uh, what people want like to know about that. And so far, uh, nobody is here yet, but let me introduce uh, people who are here. And what does it mean here in physical space? <laughs> yes, uh, first is Anna Marianovich Shane, um, and uh, who is uh, checking on the her computer. She will follow uh, participation on her computer. And uh, also our uh, guest uh, from Spain, David Garcia. Romero. Romero. Okay, Romero. Okay, well, somebody's uh, on. Is it you? It's me. Oh, <laughs> I can see your eye here. So, I have uh, a little delay on mine. Okay, so. <laughs> but I can see my past here, looking at myself a few seconds. And, and another, yeah, a few seconds, yeah. yeah. And another person who participates, of course, me, it's Eugene Matusov. Um, so, I think we should start. Uh, we'll see who will join us uh, for this uh, live video. Okay, so what's our topic today? It's topic heteroglossia and heterodiscussia. Okay, mm -hmm. that's true. Okay, well, in my view, uh, let me say that how uh, I see this topic, or actually why this topic is important in education. How did it get in education? Because uh, Bakhtin introduced him for his literary analysis, I think, in uh, probably in Dostoevsky first. And uh, then he talked about that in some other context. But we in uh, in education, so where it comes to education. And, uh, and my tracking of that notions, it come probably, I may be wrong, but I, I think it is my hypothesis. They come from uh, um, discourse analysis of the conventional classrooms that uh, started probably in uh, England in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So they analyzed the discourse and they found that uh, conventional discourse in the uh, conventional classroom <laughs> uh, uh, looks like like triadic discourse. It's initiated by the teacher, then student reply, and the teacher uh, provides some kind of evaluation of that reply. And uh, after that, the people uh, have uh, different look at this triadic discourse uh, because uh, they focus: is it evaluation or is it follow up or so and so forth? And uh, they found some diverse version of this triadic discourses mm -hmm. and so forth. So. But, uh, and people uh, in general, people meaning educators, uh, criticize the triadic discourse mm -hmm. because it feels very deadly. It's like, uh, okay, David, mm -hmm. two plus two equals four. That's correct, David. And uh, this kind of discourse uh, feels exactly very deadly because um, it's about like, uh, checking whether or not David actually knows about that. Yeah. And it's going against... Uh, I think it's, can I interrupt you for a second? No, you cannot, no, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It feels very deadly because people talking about something nobody's interested in. Yeah. The teacher knows what's two plus two and is not interested to find out anything new just to check. The student is uh, being asked to answer something which whether they are interested or not doesn't make any difference and their answer is not going to lead to more finding out anything more about it so it's kind of like a talking for not for from interest but from some kind of a constant being on the spot checking mm -hmm. are you as good as being uh, whatever, on task yeah, on task. Mm -hmm. yeah and uh, uh, yeah and it can uh, you can actually deepen that analysis because mm -hmm. it's deadly for many different things 
Also, it violates uh, almost like, uh, I, I want to say, expectation for a live conversation. Because in a live conversation, usually people, when people ask questions, they usually indicate that they don't know themselves something. That's one mm -hmm. assumption. And another assumption that they're interested in what they're asking. Otherwise, why would they ask them? Yeah. Both of these assumptions are completely uh, uh, not valid in, this, yes. in the uh, school discourse. Mm -hmm. Also, you can think about to the other discourses that might be looking like, for example, like challenging, that there is some newcomer to the community and it will challenge. Or is it a sport game, like I'm quizzing you because it's kind of a competition. But it's mm -hmm. all of these uh, cases is might be called rather contrived cases, and school is probably most contrived out of all of these contrived uh, 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 discourses or conversations. So people, when they start criticizing this conventional <coughs> discourse, uh, they, of course, uh, the elephant in the room becomes, so what's good discourse, educational discourse, mm -hmm. look like? And that's why, in a way, uh, Bakhtin uh, start offering a Halmurin, uh, uh, start offering a alternative, like ideas for how good discourse might look like. Okay, and specifically, Bakhtin introduced these two notions: heterodiscursia, uh, heteroglossia, and heterodiscursia, uh, which is in uh, English-speaking literature only one uh, term really get, in my view, uh, good foot, which is. Heteroglossia, which literally means diverse voices. And this is exactly what, in my view, Bakhtin, um, uh, what he meant, because he used Russian word uh, Raznagolosia, uh, which is Razna means diverse, or Greek word hetero, uh, very good. And uh, Galosia means uh, uh, voice, which is uh, gloss. I, and I suspect that Russian word gloss and uh, Greek word gloss may, may, may be yeah. uh, uh, the same roots and probably mm -hmm. coming from uh, Greek uh, language. I'm not sure. Interesting to check. So another term, unfortunately, had a very bad fate in English-speaking uh, word, and probably not English-speaking, but probably French. I cannot say about Italian. Um, and it's interesting to check about Italian translations because uh, I think the first translation of Bakhtin work uh, was in Italian, uh, the, his book on Dostoevsky mm -hmm. yeah. in the 60s. Actually, uh, the whole story about how Bakhtin uh, become uh, reintroduced both in uh, Soviet Union and in the, like, outside of Soviet Union, it's actually thanks to the Italian communists, they somehow have become familiar, some of them, with this book of Dostoevsky and what the translation of that. So the book was translated in, uh, book on Dostoevsky was translated in Italian. So I don't know what Italian word uh, for Raznorechia, uh, in Russian it's Raznorechia. So it's, it's, so Bakhtin used two terms, which is, in Russian, sounds so similar. One is Raznogolosia, we say Getroglosia, and another one, Raznorechia. And rich in Russian, in this particular uh, it, uh, sense, means discourse, although it has many other uh, ways, other connotations and meanings. So it's uh, diverse discourses. The problem with this term in English that it came from French, and in French it was translated by structuralist uh, Christiva as uh, uh, intertextuality, uh, yes, which is extremely, <laughs> in some ways, almost like opposite term to Bakhtin, and I'm pretty sure that Bakhtin would not like that. Uh, the first person, as far as I know, pick up on this mistranslation was uh, Tsvetan Todorov, and he criticized uh, this translation as intertextuality, uh, <coughs> Um, uh, uh, this term. Unfortunately for all of us, uh, Tsvetan Todorov did not uh, translate, retranslate that word to English and uh, or French probably, and so we know his uh, critique but not alternative. So, yes, that's uh, 
as alternative, I try to uh, create this very, uh, I would say, uh, clumsy term. And I'll tell you why is it clumsy. And one can say I like that because I try to create a term that's a parallel to uh, heteroglossia, heterodiscussia, because in Russian they're very much parallel. Yeah, yeah. In uh, Serbian, uh, exactly uh, like that. Разно, разно голосия, разно речи. It sounds like разно, разно means different. And I, so I would try to keep that hetero, right? Then I used the word discourse, and the problem is that it's so clumsy translation because <laughs> hetero coming from Greek language and, and discourse, discourse from Latin. Right. I was actually entertaining this uh, using a Greek word for discourse, but unfortunately it's so unknown, so it becomes I forgot. <laughs> that's, that's why, why it's that's, no. that's why it's not good <laughs> in my view. Uh, but it exists. You can uh, what the word discourse and translate it in Greek and see what it is. And again, for Greek folks, it will be perfect probably. But yes, for everybody else, maybe not that perfect. Amelia. Amelia. Yes, Amelia. 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 Yeah, yeah. Amelia. Okay. Sounds great. But again, sorry, I uh, for the folks, I translate it as hetero discourse. Now, you might ask, why Christian term is very bad? Well, its irony is that for Bakhtin, a structuralist, or uh, before that, formalist, were uh, his kind of conceptual opponents. And it's funny that it's revenge of structuralists who took his <laughs> term, <laughs> appropriated, which is, I don't like that word, uh, it's always uh, sounds like stealing uh, to me, <laughs> and appropriate that and uh, coin that into the word as if it's Bakhtin, and it's not. It's Kristeva, you know. It's a good term for Kristeva, but not a good term for Bakhtin. And again, it's a structuralist term. First of all, she reduced, of course, uh, discourse to text. Mm -hmm. And discourse is definitely not the text. It's mm -hmm. not, uh, it's actually, uh, as we know, social linguists, how much the struggle of capturing uh, discourse into the text. And the, mm -hmm. uh, many of them um, find it's impossible. And uh, some of them, I forgot her name, uh, she studied that conversation of friends at the, I think, Thanksgiving dinner. And with the whole book companion of this analysis, she including she included uh, audio records of that conversation. Mm -hmm. That's how difficult it's to put a uh, discourse in the text. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. But another one, uh, also it's interesting how she changed hetero into inter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, which is again, she... It's in, quite opposite. Yes, yes. Yeah. and she, in my view that she's killing this uh, completely different potential that mm -hmm. would work mm -hmm. inside. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Again, uh, returning to the things what I was starting with. Uh, mm -hmm. So the idea why educators, in my view, so much interested in this Bakhtinian um, terms of, uh, or concept of heteroglossy uh, and heterodiscourse is because they try to find alternative uh, discourse to the classroom conventional discourse, to those triadic kind mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. and, um, so, uh, okay, let me see what people, did the people want to go to some other directions where, okay. Well, those who are watching, and so far uh, I see Kalashio, uh -huh. in Brazil a lot of people called intertextuality. I talked today in classroom that Bakhtin is not interested in text. Good to hear your explanation. Okay, that's Kalashio, Booms yeah. and Junior. Hi Kalashio, yes. And uh, Veronica is also uh, oh, okay. watching, uh -huh. but uh, Veronica, uh, please send us your yeah. question or comment. Uh, do we want to go this way? Uh, uh, I have a question more please. about this course and dialogue. Um, can dialogue be uh, uh, equated to this course? My answer to no. Dialogue is not discourse, and discourse has limitations. And there is another kind of a thing that's going on. Um, in my view, there is a trap, uh, this history of dissatisfaction of, with conventional discourse, conventional school discourse, has a trap, a particular trap. And unfortunately, we are people who are excited by Bakhtin, 
when you're fast going into exactly to the, that trap, uh, which meaning uh, uh, equating discourse, uh, discourse with uh, dialogue, that's one thing, but there's much bigger trap. Uh, and in my view, that biggest trap is um, it, uh, that actually <laughs> using structural analysis for analyzing discourse. Mm -hmm. And structural analysis in itself, uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing in my view, but it has limitation. It's very good structural analysis for analyzing discourse of the conventional classroom. Why? Because it's not about meaning making. <laughs> Again, if we did, thanks by the way, uh, uh, David, for being such a good sport of pretending to be uh, a conventional student when I ask you two plus two equals, oh, and yeah. you said, because it, it's interesting, if you ask that question, I would say the classroom discourse, or I would say that the context yeah. of scientists talking about it. <laughs> like, if you ask on the street, uh, where right now at the university, but if you're going to the street and just bump at my colleagues or current or former students. And I've asked, I already did this, by the way, and ask this question, two plus two equals, and they just look, what? <laughs> out of blue. By the way, I do it out of blue in my classes. Nothing, it's not even in context. Like with you, at least I ask you, I provided some context yeah. and then ask your question, right? But in classroom, I ask the question without any context, just out of blue. Two plus two equals, and later, I repeated that, and I know that students wanted to resist me to answer immediately, but it's almost it's so difficult to resist, because there is kind of this almost internal, you need to answer. On the other hand, outside of the classroom, it's no problem, like people are like, what? Like, why are you asking that? <laughs> or they will tell like, <laughs> like, like, like uh, you can see, like, what it's saying, what, and sometimes they say, what? They ask that, like, meaning right. that something is, um, there is breakdown of our communication, mm -hmm. serious breakdown. Mm -hmm. And they want to know like what's going on. Like, would they miss something? What I'm doing? Uh, like, am I, like, it's a joke? Mm -hmm. Am I crazy? Mm -hmm. Or what's but going imagine on? Imagine a student answering like that. What? Yeah. yeah. It's so inappropriate for a student. For, uh, that's, I experienced only once, actually, mm -hmm. uh, where actually with my son, who attended was, uh, 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 First grade, he was attending an innovative school in Utah. Uh, Barbara Rogoff's kids were attending that, and I'm really thankful to her for suggesting uh, <laughs> for us to, bro uh, to bring our son there. I remember that pretty well. I asked some kind of question, not two plus two, but something like that. And his answer was, I know. And I said, well, I know. If you know that, tell me. And I said, I'm telling you, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and that's interesting circles, which is very, in many ways, makes sense of breaking this conventional uh, discourse about two plus two equals what. Right? Mm -hmm. But let me tell you, where is the trap? Well, because we started talking about mm -hmm. the trap. The trap is uh, for uh, analysis of conventional schooling, uh, structural analysis is perfect. Why? Mm -hmm. Because uh, a conventional classroom is not, in my view, about meaning making. It's about pattern recognition. The teachers uh, provide some pattern that students need to recognize. Mm -hmm. some, it is sometimes con uh, con uh, conditional pattern. So in one circumstance, there is one pattern, another, another pattern, mm -hmm. and then produce that on request. And testing is actually, it's very good to test that pattern recognition, mm -hmm. students' pattern recognition. But, and for that structural analysis, great. Tragic, uh, uh, this analysis is terrific, and my feeling is this, this hetero discourse in hetero glossia is also part of the structural analysis. And I think this is a trap to focus on this discourse analysis, because uh, discourse, especially structural discourse analysis, because it could be some other discourse analysis, but a structural discourse analysis of, like say, I'm finding how much heterodiscourse and heteroglossia are present there, mm -hmm. right? Coding it's like that. Coding yeah. like, like that. that. It's not it's measuring. It's a structural. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you where I see a good uh, a litmus test about uh, uh, <laughs> where it says pattern recognition or uh, meaning making. 
uh, meaning making requires that people has to engage uh, with his or her heart and mind in that. You really need to get into the ideas, into feelings about what's going on. If you don't need to do that, sorry to say, it means you're in structures. Yeah. That doesn't require that. Mm -hmm. I can notice uh, hetero discursia without much getting into uh, ideas mm -hmm. or feelings or mm -hmm. and hetero mm -hmm. uh, heteroglossy as well. It's interesting things. Yeah. Like, for example, you know how much uh, conventional classroom ask uh, usually closed-ended questions, like, for example, two mm -hmm. plus two equals and so on. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't we uh, ask uh, teachers to ask open-ended questions? In mm -hmm. my again, it's this kind of things is not uh, uh, leaving the sphere of the structural analysis. Okay. Open-ended, closed-ended. Yeah. We're never getting into talking about what people are talking about. What or why you do you care about asking yeah. these open-ended questions? Or uh, closed-ended questions? What's wrong? There's nothing wrong yeah. sometimes to ask uh, closed-ended yeah. questions. It, it still will be different from the closed-ended mm -hmm. question that uh, ask usually in conventional school. Although it still mm -hmm. will be closed-ended. Yeah. There is a lot of closed-ended questions uh, that are very meaningful. Yeah. Like for instance, you can say, uh, in a store, I can look at two blouses and say, which one do you like better that I should buy, this one or that one? Yeah. And of course, Alex asked, is it meaning making, not pattern recognition? In my view, no. What do you want? Do you want what, what do you want to say? I, think you... I was, you heard me thinking. Yes. I was uh, thinking really that the example that Anna, really loud. <laughs> <laughs> the example that Anna gave is an open ended question, but it, no, it's it, close -ended. sorry, it's a close ended question, but it implies an open ended question. Because when you are asking whether which one do you prefer, somehow you're implicitly asking why. Maybe you don't continue in that in the conversation, but the why is the preference is implied there, or is it not? Open ended is in a sense, uh, I think I see where you're going. I'm asking for what you like. Hmm. Not for a correct question. Yeah. Again, I'm asking from my interest, but it's a closed, closed structure on the surface, but the interest there is for really finding information. What do you like better? Mm -hmm. This one or that one? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, so uh, Alex asked a question whether or not... Uh, by the way, can I see... I'm seeing all the people, right? Okay. Uh, ask whether or not me, my... Thing, and, uh, uh, we discussed that in some podcast about that, but no, uh, meaning making and pattern recognition is not the same. And mm -hmm. uh, the pattern recognition, this is what, this is why it's so exciting what's going on with technology right now, because it's based on pattern recognition, and we're going so far ahead with the Siri, with this Alexa, Alexa mm -hmm. with this, uh, hey, hey Google. Uh, and also self-driving cars and all that. But what's the difference between pattern recognition and meaning making? Mm -hmm. Because this become now interesting, mm -hmm. like why can't meaning making be uh, 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 coded in a structuralist way? Well, because again, uh, meaning making cannot be, <laughs> meaning making is very ephemeral things. It's a relationship, first okay, of all. So, so, so it's not like it's an a really juicy example. Well, our juicy example is the whole conversation that we have right now. That's <laughs> our juicy, the most uh, juicy. But again, if you ask, uh, like, uh, again, uh, meaning making, engaging, like, one, two plus two equals four. And again, as soon as in making, the problem is with meaning making, you cannot capture that. And that's already anti scientific in a way. You cannot operationalize meaning making. Because mm -hmm. it's ephemeral, it constantly, constantly escapes. So when I'm giving uh, meaning making, in a way I'm playing with meaning making. Mm -hmm. It's not real meaning making, because yeah. you cannot Example is capture. already finished. In example is already finished, mm -hmm. and it's already become part of discourse that you can look at that, mm -hmm. and that kills it. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I, I can give it to you, because yeah. it's very difficult otherwise to talk, and I hate when people uh, sometimes, uh, what I call, uh, mystify things mm -hmm. and I don't want to mystify meaning making no. although it's very good it's a good candidate for mystification yes. <laughs> All right. so let's say we in this uh, since I love math uh, let's we get to this example of 2 plus 2 
equals four. But that's uh, that meaning of that will be defined what kind of question is trying to you have and trying to answer and counter questions about that like why uh, uh, what does it mean to plus two equals four what do you mean by this by the way that's mean but with this you need to be really interested in that mm -hmm. question so right now we are probably not but mm -hmm. you really need to interest it. like why the hell we're asking the question why we should drop everything in the world and uh, instead thinking about two plus two, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When it's true, when it's not true. Like uh, my favorite example, four friends, two friends plus two friends, not necessarily four, four friends. friends. And it's actually not necessarily even... We uh, don't even know how many. It's, yes. it's impossible to answer. Yes. Maybe and, nine, maybe yeah, one, yeah, maybe yeah, two, right, maybe right. three. And is it interesting, like, can be a two plus two equals, let's say, five or three? And yes, it is possible. In, from a mathematical point of view. But again, all of this uh, will become in the relationship between people uh, having questions or asking or having inquiries mm -hmm. or having tensions, and mm -hmm. which they really concern and serious answer to that. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the serious answer can be a bit of a joke as well. That's but right. it, is, mm -hmm. uh, it has that serious concerned about those mm -hmm. things, unless it's a, there is a change of the topic or mm -hmm. will be a heter discourse yeah. and you're moving to another something, mm -hmm. something else. So, and uh, this is not uh, pattern. Pattern recognition is, uh, is, you can grab that. That's because it's called pattern. It's defined by sh form. And self-contained. And self-contained, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's not in the relationships, it's not in the context, it's not in the whole constellation where it can change with everything, but it's standing there on its own. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the problem is what technology right now have within, I don't know if how much you guys want to go in the pattern recognition, not to return heterogloss and heterodiscursia, but if you look at about pattern recognition, one of the exciting part of that, that technology still could not uh, develop pattern recognition that organic system uh, develops. We're still in the mechanistic pattern recognition and not even organic pattern mm -hmm. recognition. And um, the difference between them, the pattern recognition, by the way, there is another thing about pattern. It's not only pattern recognition, but pattern production. Um, and that's why we have like, for example, writing I need to, or uh, language. I need to produce certain patterns and uh, not only recognize, but produce certain patterns. Mm -hmm. And uh, Alexa, all of this, not only doing pattern recognition, but pattern production as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, besides that, any pattern based on bias, mm -hmm. there are certain bias that, that define the shape. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that mechanisms don't have biases. Why do you say any pattern has a bias? Well, in order to find, uh, l let's say, for example, uh, the uh, let's say Siri, if you take mm -hmm. Siri, right? Mm -hmm. Well, when you ask a question, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, today I ask a question, Siri, play NPR. Mm -hmm. uh, it should recognize my pattern. From Siri, there is not, uh, Eugene didn't ask anything. But for Siri, it's a pattern of the sound. Uh, oh, there is sound. There's no pattern, but there is a sound stream, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to find a pattern out of that. Uh, and that pattern is pretty unique. Because I cannot even repeat what I said myself in the same way as a stream, right? Mm -hmm. So it needs to find a so-called what command I gave to Syria. And this mm -hmm. is the bias. Mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, so to find one out of possible who knows how many. Yes, of the command. So it's kind of like it's a biasing it toward more probability that if you said that, than something else. Yeah, but this is this or that mm -hmm. is a biases yeah. in the mm -hmm. system. The problem is that right now in all mechanistic system, the bias is brought by humans. Mm -hmm. It's outside of mechanism itself. In any a life organism, like say in bacteria, bacteria mm -hmm. is uh, has biases, which means it's attracted to something, it's mm -hmm. repelled to something, and it's neutral to something else. Mm -hmm. And that bias is part of life of the bacteria. And in Siri, there is nothing like that at all. Because it's not a line. <laughs> exactly. And this is what I'm saying, mechanistic uh, pattern recognition versus organistic. But even organistic pattern recognition has nothing to do with meaning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's why I think uh, the structural uh, uh, 
э, дискурсы анализа, which is very much interesting in heteroglossia, это дискуссия, in my view, it's a trap for us, for us, meaning people interested in Bakhtinian dialogic pedagogy. Mm -hmm. And researching it as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, there are people who are analyzing dialogic uh, pedagogy as a discourse. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I would agree that for me, at least, they really don't capture the heart of dialogue there at all. Yeah. Because dialogue becomes, uh, in their analysis, what happens there becomes irrelevant on the shape of the dialogue. Is it heterodoxy or heterodiscussia? Mm -hmm. Is it uh, the teacher answers this way or that way? How many minutes or something like that? Out of that, if I would read that, I would not know what happened in that classroom whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to, let's say, somebody writes a story about what happened in, yeah. in that class. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, that, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, in my view, again, uh, if you look at the Bakhtin himself, again, he was not doing an education. Uh, I'm not talking about his one article when he is in education, but uh, I'm talking about in literacy analysis. He also used structural analysis of discourse, which is where he brought this notion of heterodiscourse and heteroglossia. But his, uh, his structural analysis subordinated to this other analysis of dialogue, mm -hmm. not only discourse, mm -hmm. but the dialogue in as a, uh, uh, as a um, part of a uh, literary verbal masterpiece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So well, my question is then uh, how to use or not use, how, how useful could be uh, heteroglossia and heterodiscussia in understanding a dialogue not as a discourse but as a uh, human uh, uh, a relationship among people and um, their search for whatever truth or inter interesting information to find out. No, no, uh, you know what, let me maybe rewind it back. Mm -hmm. I might be too harsh on criticizing structural analysis mm -hmm. of discourse. It has a lot of, uh, I found that it has a lot of interesting points, like for example, uh, one of the interesting points, if you really, let's say, go with the idea of heterodiscursia, it's very difficult to, in education, mm -hmm. do testing. Uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, heterodiscursia, like, let me give a, a specific example, mm -hmm. uh, my favorite example, although uh, that I came to that independently from an, uh, my colleague who uh, used okra. I, since I don't like okra, I use tomato, so example. Yeah, uh, but it's a, Tony Whitson, uh, mm -hmm. or is a plant. But mm -hmm. uh, my example is about tomatoes, since I don't like okra. Okay. <laughs> and so the question is, like, is tomato and uh, a vegetable or a fruit? What do you okay. think, then? Is tomato a vegetable or a fruit? I actually don't care, but I think all fruits <laughs> are vegetables. <laughs> All but, fruits are vegetables. Is it the other way around, true? No. All fruits are vegetables. But okay. All vegetables but, are fruits. And why do you think that all fruits are vegetables? Because for me, vegetable is uh, equal to a uh, plant. And fruits it, are they, they, it, There is some difference on uh -huh. the definition between Spanish and English. Mm -hmm. So I am mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. rather confused now. You see, he's so con uh, confusing person. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't care, would you put kind of tomato in the fruit salad? Well, I, I, yeah, I actually, what is it, a fruit salad? Ah, okay, yeah, okay. First, okay, fruit salad. Will I put tomato in a fruit salad? I could try, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I would. <laughs> and, and Why I wouldn't you? I would not eat it. Because Why not? I, because it doesn't uh, go together, right? Yeah. The oranges and the, the, uh, the watermelons. Would so. you put orange in a normal salad? Yes, actually. So the other way around. It, it works it? the other way around. <laughs> yeah. So orange sometimes can be uh, a vegetable. Would you put apple in a normal salad? Yes. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so but uh, if uh, by the way, this, right now what's going on a lot of. Uh, 
low level meaning making because as you said you don't care about this question mm -hmm. and Anna tried to make you care about that but, <laughs> <Yeah. that's> <laughs> but she was kind of succeeding though really? okay. <laughs> okay. see okay so now analyze this low okay. level meaning making well in school if you say that uh, tomato is a vegetable you will be punished on exam because of course was, we all know all rational people, well-educated people, that tomato is a fruit. What the question is? What's the question is? Yes. Is well, the question, rather... if you well-educated person, rational, okay. which I start down, doubting about you, <laughs> <laughs> because the question is, how do you, what does it mean? How do you know that tomato is a fruit? That's, because we that's learned this school. Yeah. Well, that, that's a very good answer, yeah. but... My teacher says. Yeah, my teacher said. But uh, if you ask what the teacher said, why? Good teacher. Good teacher. They said because there is seeds inside of that. It's an yeah. organ of a plant for reproduction. Yes. But the question become next question becomes, why is it uh, 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 plants with uh, seeds would be called fruits, nevertheless? <laughs> What's fruity about them? And imagine that uh, interesting things that when it was introduced, which probably I suspect, I asked that question by the way a lot of people. So far, I couldn't find answer. Maybe I, I don't know anybody who knows deeply uh, biology or history of biology. Like why the, anything with uh, the why biology is called anything that have uh, seeds inside of that fruits? I couldn't find so far answer from anyone. Uh, and it's interesting because if you think about the history of the biology, right? Uh, people were eating things like tomato that was coming from uh, Americas, right, and Europe, and they start using that in culinary. From culinary point of view, it's uh, definitely vegetable because it's coming with the main dish as a site for the main dish, right? And some nuts, but in biology, start calling it fruit. I'm pretty sure that around that time it requires serious explanation of why. And the question is, what was the explanation of that? And still couldn't find that answer. But anyway, this is, uh, in my view... Uh, in no, I will tell you the answer. What? Fruits and plants are organs for reproduction. So what? Why to call it fruit? Why do you call plants plants? Scientific question. Uh, oh, this is which means you don't know. That's <laughs> 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 short. <laughs> or masking. <laughs> Say that I don't know. <laughs> Scientists call that way, but, but there again, is a definition. No, it's not definition. Think about that. People who came to that definition, as you call, should have a very good reason to do that. So what was and which going against? Uh, just yeah. a, just let me finish. Against common culture, they should have a very good reason to come with that. Fruit, in, at least in English, and probably it comes from Latin, also means product. Product mm -hmm. of a plant. Plant produces it. It's not the plant itself. Um, Plata products potato. No, no, it, no but that's not fruit. Yeah. It's it's a it's a uh, tuber of the so it's not a fruit. It's again, a again, I would like to know a better problem. answer. You may be going to that, but yeah. I still would like. Okay. For me, it's not well, satisfactory. Now we, we, we have not, to go and read science. Exactly. <laughs> please, please educate me, Chin, about that. Okay. Uh, oh, he's leaving the podcast. So Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Uh, Bye. Uh huh. Um, yeah, Veronica, you don't know what's hetero discursive because I invented that term. That's why you don't know. But it's not I invented it, I translated from Bakhtin. So uh, it's kind of Bakhtin and I. Yeah. And, and before Bakhtin, of course, if you start asking who, like, it was somebody in, uh, like, people in Russia use the okay, term all so the time. So just answer, where she, can she read more about that? Uh, about, ah. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I introduced, yeah, I introduced the term in um, uh, my article about uh, in, in, cons uh, in uh, reconciliable, in the reconciliable difference between Bakhtin and Vygotsky. Also, uh, you can um, find critique of uh, Todorov critique of the Kristeva uh, mistranslation of Bakhtin terms as intertextuality in the, the same article. You can look at the article because I put that um, 
that story and references back there. So you can find uh, Stefan uh, Todorov uh, critique of uh, Kristeva right there. I'm sorry, my, I have too mature memory to remember about that. But back to that, what, what I, I, I want just to bring this point about uh, goodness of the structural analysis. It's not like mm -hmm. bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. It might be unsatisfactory thing. Why is it not bad thing? Because it disrupts uh, a lot of about conventional classroom. Mm -hmm. About it, as soon as you start introducing, uh, bringing this uh, heterodiscursia, it means uh, you cannot do. You should be careful when you do things on the test, because the students can, uh, of course, be right by bringing some kind of other context in the activity, mm -hmm. uh, right? And so, uh, for example, so tomato for culinary activity, tomato is a vegetable, and at least in some cultures, mm -hmm. culinary mm -hmm. cultures. But in uh, kind of uh, science, positive science of biology, it it's is classified food. as Yeah, food. and we need to know why. Still, I couldn't yeah. find the answers, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of students don't have that answer, although they might not even care about the question, because schools usually doesn't make, uh, uh, mm -hmm. does not help students to so care about something. So in this sense, we are mixing these courses, this course that's culinary discourse, and this course This is not mixing. Or bringing them together, yeah. or, or uh, tricking people in this case, like uh, is tomato a vegetable or a fruit? As if there is or there, it's both depending on the yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. there is this bifurcation mm -hmm. and there is quantity like that. So part of this mono monologism is monologizing discourse, which means making one discourse out of out of, out of many. Out of many. Mm -hmm. It could be many mm -hmm. because think about how much you start talking about. I, I don't care that discourse mm -hmm. of caring about mm -hmm. things are not caring mm -hmm. about that. That's another type of discourse. Really, all of them related to each other, one way or another, but mm -hmm. loosely related, and we can uh, we can go with them. Mm -hmm. And and kind of uh, so the good pedagogical dialogue do, should uh, have this uh, aspect of heter uh, discursivity, maybe <laughs> another new word. Um, and also, so we can discuss heteroglossy. Mm -hmm. Somebody interested in mm -hmm. that? Okay. Okay, yeah, good. Uh, ah, I'm gonna put that, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. And again, you can find Todorov in that, uh, in my article, because I, uh, unfortunately mm -hmm. I cannot bring it immediately. Mm -hmm. So where are we going from there? PayPal. Okay, so we were talking about discursive dialogue, and we were talking about dialogue is meaning making, and is there any other approach to dialogue? You said that so you are not very much interested in your heteroglossia? No. Okay, that may be my question. Uh, no, no, it's fine. Yeah. It's fine. Because since we're discussing, like, we should talk about something that we are interested, not about... We are, but we can somehow talk mm -hmm. about the, both things at the same time, because you just said good pedagogical approach to, should engage in heteroglossia and heterodiscursia. Heterodiscursivity. Why? Uh, that's yeah, that's a good question. Why? Well, because, uh, again, uh, we're talking about a dialogue. So this idea is purification of uh, both in terms of the uh, words, mm -hmm. uh, so the words should be your or somebody's, pure, pure words. It's like plagiarism, right? Yeah. Okay. Like, like you, should no, 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 no. Uh, you should not use the words of others. And if you're using it, you need to immediately tell that it's others, mm -hmm. which is to some degree, it's a rather crazy thing because, like, think about that. I'm using words of Todorov. Well, I'm glad I, I created him, but I'm so pretty sure I'm using, using, using words of many other people who might stop even recognizing that I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Eugene, you have to be a minus three mm -hmm. points for plagiarism. Mm -hmm. uh, this constant concern about purity of the war, of the words, mm -hmm. of the voice, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, it's very monologic uh, concern, mm -hmm. as well as purity of discourse. Or purity, like sometimes they say, you have to stay on task. Mm -hmm. This is again purity of the task, mm -hmm. and it should be only one. Mm -hmm. I think uh, when you talk about purity of the voice, uh, uh, so now I'm confused. Uh, 
but it also talks about uh, double voiceness. Yes. So that through your own words, you can actually hear the voice of somebody else. Right. Mm -hmm. But this is, is that what you meant? Or just yeah, no, no, but I'm just saying that the school mm -hmm. very much concerned about that because it's kind of bad things, it's plagiarism. But sometimes is it like when I hear myself saying something to my son and suddenly said, oh my God, I hear my mother speaking. I should believe it said, as my mother said. Well, from school point of view, yes. But you actually bring another very, very interesting topic, in my view, about uh, uh, hetero, uh, heteroglossia. And heteroglossia is not parallel to heterodiscourse, in no, my view. No. Mm -hmm. uh, what you brought on that, uh, Bakhtin introduced the notion of heteroglossia mm -hmm. in kind of almost always in negative context. Mm -hmm which is uh, it's kind of a very symptomatic of underground people who mm -hmm. hear hostile voices constantly in them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and trying to deal with them and uh, they deal with the kind of uh, and they deal in different ways sometimes it's kind of what he called excessive dialogism sometimes it's kind of a joke using authority voice changing that into mm -hmm. joke mm -hmm. ambivalence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that. But again, if you think about it, it's only kind of a struggle against somebody and not good struggle. It's a struggle yeah. with authority, yeah. struggle with oppression. Mm -hmm. So the question is uh, whether or not heteroglossia can exist uh, in kind of positive, affirmative things, uh, mm -hmm. like a welcome things, rather than a mark of mm -hmm. uh, mm, uh, a mark of oppression. Let me give one example of this kind of things which is a kind of uh, political soviet political jewish joke mm -hmm. and soviet union uh, there was time when uh, jews uh, were allowed to leave soviet union and then they were not allowed to leave soviet union and that was uh, uh, ronald reagan president of the united states who was uh, heavily arguing for uh, freedom of uh, people to leave country they want to leave country especially for jews uh, and he was visiting Soviet Union, and the joke was about that KGB called uh, people, Jewish people who wanted to leave, but were refused, mm -hmm. was called refusnik, or in Russian, atkaznik. Uh, and they called them and said, you know what, uh, uh, President of uh, the United States, Ronald Reagan, is going to uh, come to Soviet Union, and we know that he will want to meet with you. And when they ask, uh, when they will meet with you, you should need to tell him, uh, Ronald Reagan, we're not going to, uh, we don't, we're not going to leave Soviet Union. If you don't say that, you will go to the Gulag. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, Reagan came and uh, met with Soviet Jews, uh, refuseniks or uh, Arkazniki, and they told him, Reagan, we don't go to, we're not going to leave Soviet Union? So they repeat the phrase, but with question mark, which is in Russian as possible. You don't have to change the phrase. But it becomes kind of double voice to the authority. Mm -hmm. Instead of uh, being an uh, affirmative statement about intentions, it's it becomes questioning and actually ask for help. Mm -hmm. Because it seems like, what? What? Uh, are uh, we not living? Yeah, we're not living <laughs> even after you coming here and advocating for us. <laughs> It's still, it's still, it's, you still haven't solved the problem. <laughs> okay, but I think I, I got very interested in heteroglossia mm -hmm. in a welcome way because mm -hmm. okay. if we are talking from a dialogic appro approach, voice is actually always in relationship. Yeah, voice doesn't make sense if it's out of relationship. Yes, of the relation of a, dia mm -hmm. a dialogic relation. So, in this sense, my voice has some part of the other on it all the time so it's already kind of enact not enacted but iterated towards mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. and at the same time the other uh, addresses to you mm -hmm. so actually when you like you, you are part of the words of the others too mm -hmm. so in this this is kind of a double double agency of the boys from the beginning, why double? Well, why or multiple, multiple or multiple? multiple? Of course, but it's like it's it's multiple. So even sometimes when I find myself using the words of others, mm -hmm. uh, very 
lot of times I am actually glad to see them in my own voice. So that's kind of a welcome heteroglossia, I will say. Like I, I find myself talking as a, someone that I, that I care, someone that I love, mm -hmm. and I am glad to relate what I'm saying or how am I saying it. Uh, more, more the like kind of going farther than text, like the accent mm -hmm. how we're saying it. I am glad to find that in my own voice, mm -hmm. voice. Why? So that wouldn't be a welcome. Why? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. Why? Because I care about the relationship well, that I have with this person. I, mm -hmm. I like this person, so I like mm -hmm. its influence on me too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, wouldn't that be a welcome? Uh, it's, it's very interesting because it kind of like goes opposite ways. And uh, let me tell you what I was thinking when you were talking. Sorry. Uh, uh, I was thinking that the, that sense of liking to hear uh, somebody else's voice through your own voice or your own voice in somebody else's voice again is not about meaning but about community making. Mm -hmm. right. Because that signaling that you're part of that community or they're part of your community. But not about meaning making. It's a di that different function than of a, yeah, all the peoples hanging out with each other, where the, what they are talking again is not so much important. But the, what's important is they have pleasure by just talking with each other in some way, yeah. or being signaling that community or or closeness or some kind of like having good time together, uh, which is very important function. And it's also important, I think, in the science because we are all co constantly quoting other people, signaling uh, that either we agree or disagree with them, but we are bringing these voices into our uh, papers. Uh, again, very often when you, he when you hear some critique of your article, it could be that you didn't mention this or didn't mention that. It's kind of like uh, constantly creating boundaries of which voices belong and what don't belong. Mm -hmm. Isn't it kind of like different function completely? Yeah, can meaning making exist without this community making? Because can relationship exist at all without community making? Ah, uh, that's a very good question too. I th I don't think it can, but I still think it's a different fa different uh, for different reasons. When we like or dislike that, mm -hmm. uh, it it has a slightly different uh, angle than we are just talking about the uh, yeah, meaning making. In my view, in my view, uh, meaning making in a way, let me be provocative. I actually disagree with you, oh, and, okay. and well, especially you, with me, and especially with you. <laughs> I think that a community, in a way, uh, can undermine. Uh, That's why I said yeah. uh, it can go the other way yeah. around. It's completely different. So you don't disagree. Yeah. I just didn't complete because. In a dialogue in which you are creating a difference with your between your opinion and somebody else's opinion, you're signaling the opposition, not the conver mm. convergence. Okay, I see mm -hmm. it. And um, yeah, but still, uh, if dialogue is based on relationship, relationship also maybe this here what is missing is the it's based on dialogic relationship. Dialogue, not yes, relationship. I know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The thing is what's the relationship between community and relationship in this sense so okay, the, yeah, yeah, that will be that uh, will be where we are uh, yeah that's maybe okay missing. that's very good uh, question to ask in my view the logic relationship based on idea first of all uniqueness mm -hmm. which is not what community is about mm -hmm. uh, community is trying to define to shape uniqueness in certain kind of conformity things mm -hmm. they become particular community mm -hmm. with particular things mm -hmm. which uh, again it, with particular biases with certain things will be out of this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which going against uniqueness there is nothing out from the logic point of view but that's why it's anti-communal and um, so uh, and of course uh, dialogism based on this Quoting Bakhtin on uh, uh, this uh, plentiful, uh, how do you say that, plentiful uh, consciousness uh, with equal rights. What's the full quote? Okay, let's see if I have it on. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah. 
kind of mutually respectful. No, 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 no. The no, no, no. event, something about mm-hmm. it's about event. Mm-hmm. At the end of the, the incident, it's interesting. It's kind of good phrase to remember. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, my mature memory doesn't work like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I had a question that I forgot. And let me put that way how you talk about this. Oh, I hear somebody else in my voice, and you say it's two, mm-hmm. and then it's not two, it's millions of that. In my view, there's more interesting things about that, uh, what Bakhtin's point about not having internal territories. Everything happened on the boundaries. Yeah. And that's why talking about what's inside of that, it become kind of, how to say that, a uh, vicious circle. Then I have you inside of me, but you have me inside of you, and you have... It, it, it then becomes very difficult to understand what you means. Because everything is inside, inside. And many things are there, and each of the things has many things, and each of the things have many things. Mm-hmm. So things start, authorship start collapsing. Mm-hmm. 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 I see. And that's why I'm really suspicious about the yeah, hetero, so here is your, uh, uh, heteroglossia. Your yeah. quote. The quote, please. Uh, Bakhtin talked about the plurality of consciousnesses with equal rights and each in its own world. And combined but are not merged in the unity of the event. Mm-hmm. So the plurality of voices combined but are not merged in the event. And mm-hmm. each consciousness has its own world. Mm-hmm. You know how I always imagine that? It's a... Uh, it's like a, 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 wherever you're touching each other, there is a, a potential that you will find your own skin, kind mm-hmm. of like, where is the boundary of your own meaning? But you know, can never merge into, because then the boundary breaks and there is no meaning anymore. Mm-hmm. So in my view, the boundary is more important than all these mm-hmm. unities, which mm-hmm. is communities representing. Mm-hmm. That's why I think dialogue is anti, anti-communal. Mm-hmm. Nevertheless, it needs community because people ha- need to communicate somehow, need to so, get in touch, need so, to say each other opinions, and that can be also under certain circumstances you cannot do that. Actually, the, if I may interrupt, the, yeah, uh, uh, meaning is six on the boundaries, but mm-hmm. it, again, for having a boundary, you need two unities or several unities. You need unities for the boundary be able to exist. So otherwise, uh, there is no one. There, there is no. This is not necessarily true. Actually, uh, it's a boundary that create what you call units, not the other way around. It's in that. Uh, yeah, it's a that boundary that defines the unit. Yeah, and creates it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So I think we might finish on that. The only thing I want just to add uh, that this. Uh, attempts to this uh, structural analysis of discourse. Uh, there are many interesting uh, developments, like uh, uh, that uh, Dmitry Nikodin, for example, introduced another interesting aspect of this uh, dialogic discourse, structural aspect of dialogic discourse, what he called inter- inter- interoperability. Interoperability. Yeah, interoperability. So. You know, we constantly interrupt each other, and that's part of the meaning that we care about what we're talking <coughs> And all this politeness about listening to the end, it actually can be, uh, that here, uh, Dmitry Nikulin argues, that it can be a marker of the of monologic culture, that uh, you have to finish. Well, why is it unilaterally defined when you finish? Since it's about us. Mm-hmm. And that's why this, in- and, and of course you can turn things around, like who you are to interrupt me, mm-hmm. right? But that has to be negotiated in a way. Mm-hmm. But both of them, uh, interruption and non-interruption should be welcome in a way. Rather mm-hmm. than we right now uh, get to this Western middle class culture where interruption is a bad thing. Actually, I came, from the culture. I came from the culture <laughs> when interruption is good. Did yeah. you see how we nicely yes. interrupt each other? <laughs> yes. and, and, and fighting, and fighting, yes. and, yes. and working, and talking <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> and everything is okay. And everything is okay. And sometimes not okay. No, yes. and sometimes is, is, not is it stop listening to you a kind of interruption? Yes. Okay, yes. so I was also... Yes, yes, yes. And, and going with your own thoughts, mm-hmm. and which can sort of be disrespect in, in Western culture, when you need to be a good listener. Take your turn. Yeah, bec- and finish to... At my, 
go for one year. But no, so but now my to... question to turn it around. If you are socialized into that kind of uh, a culture, yeah. this is how you operate. For, that, for you it's normal. That's why I'm saying community is enemy of dialogue. <laughs> because the community does that. Right. Even the community of interaction? Well, in, uh, in this case, community is correct. <laughs> <laughs> well, you contradict yourself. <laughs> right, well, why not? <laughs> okay, I think we are running more than an hour. I think maybe and everybody left us, except us. Which is, by the way, another interesting thing. So no, about Veronica is still here. It's Veronica no, here. No, 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 she's not. It's, it's a record oh. of Veronica. Mm, yeah. Veronica is here. But yeah. she's the memory of her. Why they actually took her, us yeah. for serious. And they're like, <laughs> but, <laughs> they don't have this Jewish. <laughs> you know what's the difference? That's a Jewish joke between the, uh, the Anglo Saxons and the Jews. You know. The Anglo Saxons, uh, the Jews say goodbye, but they don't leave. Mm -hmm. But the Anglo Saxons. Uh, don't say goodbye, and then they leave. Then they leave. <laughs> <laughs> without saying goodbye. Yes. Um, uh, say goodbye without leaving. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah okay, I think it's a good uh, uh, place to, to, to stop. And uh, let's see what people will suggest to discuss next time. By the way, feel free to kind of start something and discuss with us or without us. Uh, thanks a lot, and see you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.